Great, so it's the top of the hour. So we'll go ahead and get started. Really wonderful to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Justin Reich and I am a faculty member at MIT um, and I run a lab called the Teaching Systems Lab. Uh, and we aspire to design, implement and research the future of teacher learning. Um, and uh, in the past year, we've been really interested in trying to understand the experiences of students and teachers during COVID-19. Um, and I'm joined by my uh, dear colleague, Nima Avashia, um, a longtime teacher in the Boston Public Schools. Um, Nima, can you take a bit to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, like Justin said, my name is Nima Avashia. I'm a ninth grade ethnic studies teacher in Boston. I have worked here for the last 19 years, um, but I was born and raised in West Virginia. Glad to be here with you today. That's great. So we'll tell you about this report um, that uh, um, you know the, <laughs> that that uh, Nima helped inspire, and that uh, John Meta and I. John Meta is at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He's teaching right now, um, and uh, and I uh, put together called "Healing Community and Humanity: um, How Students and Teachers Want to Reinvent Schools Post COVID." Um, and uh, um, it's often the case that uh, for a lot of our work, Nima is our secret contributor um, and, uh, and we leave her off the author page so she can take the things we publish and show it to administrators and say, see what these people at Harvard and MIT are saying. Um, but uh, you know, Nima is very much the sort of uh, the, an intellectual North Star for us in doing this work. Um, I would say one of the, the strongest points of shared belief that Nima and I share um, is when you face difficult challenges in education, a really important starting point is to talk to students and to talk to teachers. Um, Nima, maybe you can talk a little bit about over the past year, as you transitioned from being, uh, you know, an, an, an eight, or a year and a half from an 18 year um, veteran face-to-face -face teacher to a remote teacher and then to a hybrid teacher what kind of role did talking with your students play in changing and adapting your practices sure um, i think for any of you who are educators this probably will resonate but when we transitioned in march of 2020 to remote learning um, i really felt like i became a first year teacher again i didn't know how to be successful in that context i didn't know what was going to work for kids i didn't know how to reach kids in the way that i did in person in person i felt pretty successful as an educator and i felt very very unsuccessful um, as a remote teacher and um i decided that like no one really knew how to be a good remote teacher because no one had done it before and that the only way we were going to figure it out is if we talked to young people about what they needed and wanted and figured out how to build spaces that responded to their needs. We None of us have lived through a pandemic. Justin likes to say, no one alive today unless you were alive in 1918. No one knows what it's like to be a student during a pandemic that is ongoing. No one knows what that experience has been like for young people. And if we want to create educational opportunities that work for young people, we really have to be listening to them and learning from them about what will and won't work for them. And so with Justin's help, I sort of started to design like a series of conversations with my students early in the pan pandemic, like in May of 2020, first to think about what September of 2020 was gonna look like. And then over the course of the, that school year, really continuing to revisit and check in with young people all the time about what was and wasn't working. And then as we got to the spring of last year, I sort of felt like, well, what would it look like if we did this with more young people? What if we asked these same questions to young people as we face September and a re-entry into schools, how could we use this sort of like model of listening to students to design educational environments that work better for them and were more responsive to their needs and their wants? Thank you, Nima. Um, so one of the things that we were able to do then, um, and we'll talk about more as we go along, is take some of these questions that Nima had come up with in asking her students um, and invite hundreds of teachers, mostly around the United States, to ask these questions for their students. Um, so in the, in the spring of last year, sort of uh, April, May, and June, um, we had about 250 teachers interview about 5,000 students um, and then bring their insights, their ideas back to us. And we'll tell you some more about what those questions are. Um, 
in our lab, we had a chance to interview about 60 teachers from across the United States and ask them um, similar kinds of questions that were asking the students, which were basically, how did last year go? What worked? What didn't? And what do we need to learn to make this year more effective? Um, to make this year more powerful, more meaningful, um, uh, a, a richer learning environment for students. Um, and then the other thing that we did that we think is really important is that we brought together teams of teachers, of students, of school leaders, of family members, and we did these design activities together, a bunch of which I'm going to share with you all today, um, of, of conversation starters that we used um, to help people start thinking about what the future of schools uh, might look like. Um, so all of that we want to share today. Uh, and I think what I'll do, you know, the way things will proceed is I'll give you a little overview of some of the findings that we have together. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the methods that we use to come up with these findings and really try to give you some tools that you can use um, to, to, some of you may already be doing a, an, an amazing, fabulous job engaging students, engaging teachers, thinking about what the future of uh, teaching and learning should look like here. Um, if you feel like you and your colleagues haven't yet spent enough time talking to your students about what they think this year should look like, um, this is a great opportunity to do that. It's never too late to further engage teachers and students um, in conversations about what the future of schools should look like. Um, I'll mention that this work uh, follows uh, a number of different uh, you know, a, a body of work that we're trying to do um, about the pandemic, about remote learning um, with, uh, with a team of researchers here and with partners in other places. So um, if you go to tsl.mit.edu slash COVID-19, we had a report about uh, state uh, policy. We had a report um, about imagining September of uh, 2020. Um, we had a great set of interviews uh, with teachers from last year called What's Lost, What's Left, What's Next? Um, and this report on healing community and humanity is kind of the next phase of that work. Um, one of the things that we found is that looking into this year, a question that parents, that students, that policymakers, that state leaders were asking is what kinds of schools will students go back to? Um, and we found that there were sort of three kinds of answers to that question. Um, one possibility was, uh, because I'm a Latin nerd, uh, <laughs> called the status quo anti-pandemus, that we just go back to what things were like beforehand. Um, Nima, I know you're not a big fan um, of going back to the old normal. Do you want to talk for a few minutes about a bit about what some of your concerns are about schools sort of going back to the old normal? Yeah, I, I'm a pretty firm believer that the old normal didn't work already for too many young people. Um, and that a lot of our young people, even if they're going through the paces of education or complying, that didn't mean that education was meeting their needs or providing them with the educational experience that they deserve. I'm especially worried because I think that in our pre-pandemic education, we spent a lot of time focusing on control and compliance. We spent a lot of time and energy on policing young people's bodies and stripping them of their autonomy. We spent a lot of time uh, focused on assessment as opposed to actually the process of learning. Um, and I personally have a lot of anxiety about going back to that place that wasn't a successful place for way too many of my students and really looking across the country, way too many students across the country. So, so one possible story that, you know, if you, were to, if you were to give the most positive spin on it, it would be something like the last 18 months were really terrible and it's kind of normal um, to have some nostalgia to returning back to what was before. But as Nima says so compellingly, um, it, what we had before didn't work for too many kids. A second story, and for folks who are not in the United States, I'd be really interested to hear whether or not um, you have narratives like this that are happening in your country. So folks who are not in the United States, I invite you in the chat um, to share your perspectives on this. Um, but one thing that US policymakers have been really concerned about is learning loss. Um, this idea that there's a certain amount of standard aligned content that students are supposed to learn every year, um, and they're not 
they weren't able to learn that in the past 18 months or whatever it is. Um, and so that represents some kind of learning loss. Um, and that loss needs to be remediated um, mostly through some, most of the proposals are sort of through some form of, uh, of additional schooling, like additional tutoring or after school or summer school or other kinds of things like that. Um, so uh, um, one really interesting finding from our study is we interviewed 57 teachers. We asked 200 plus teachers um, to share with us what they learned when they talked to their students. Um, and learning loss just didn't really come up. Um, when it, it came up a few times when teachers said, here's an idea that I explicitly want to reject. Um, but you know, one of the questions that we asked, uh, when we asked teachers to ask their students, what do you feel like we lost last year? Um, and, very, and a few of them talked about sort of missing some learning opportunities and being afraid that their teachers wouldn't be sympathetic. Overwhelmingly, they talked about social losses. They talked about the people in their lives that they lost. They talked about the connections to friends and families that they lost. Um, so there's this sort of really unusual moment in the United States where people uh, who are education policymakers, who write op-eds in national publications, they're like very keen on this idea of learning loss. And then we go ask a zillion teachers about it and they're like, eh. And there's not a single teacher that we talked to that said, you know what we really need to do next year? Um, we need to uh, do a bunch of additional testing and assessing of our students. We need to figure out what kinds of standards aligned content they missed last year. And we need to use high dosage tutoring to remediate those gaps. Um, there's, there's sort of no one who said that to us. Um, and so learning loss is this, it's this sort of unusual story, which is like extremely compelling to national education policymakers, to state education policymakers, and seems to have no salience at all with students and teachers. Um, and the, I would just say, sorry, Justin, did you no, mind please. if I, No, I would just say, I feel like as a teacher who just started school a week ago, this narrative is totally driving what's happening in our schools right now, right? We're already being told about the math and ELA baseline assessments that kids are going to have to take next week. People are already feeling like this huge press and urgency to jump into content. And instead of kind of like going slow and really helping kids reacclimate and helping kids relearn themselves and relearn being in community, people are feeling incredibly pressured to move into content very quickly, largely I think because of the learning loss narrative. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear in some of those places. You know, as a bunch of folks are noting in the chat, um, you know, young people are always learning. Um, and there's some really cool things that young people learned about next year. I think across the world, we have more young people with more proficiency around technology mediated communication than ever before. We had a lot of young people who got some really hard but really important practice in self-directed learning and in, 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 uh, um, in self-motivated learning. Um, one of the things that we heard from NEMA students, from her colleagues is also um, when we, sometimes when teachers ask students directly about learning loss, do you feel like you've sort of lost in your learning? Um, it's, they take it really personally and as an offense. Um, we've been doing the work. We've been working really hard over the last bunch of years, uh, you know, the last bunch of months. What do you, what's this stuff about learning loss? Um, I don't wanna minimize um, that for a lot of students, they missed really important learning opportunities. Um, there are students, you know, students with disabilities, um, students who get, have, take, get a lot of services at in-person schools that weren't able to replicate those services that had really hard years. Um, there are folks where, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a new immigrant to the United States and we're trying to get you as connected to the English language as you can um, in, the, in your first months arriving, if you missed some in-person opportunities to learn that, um, that can be really hard. Um, but I think one of the things that the learning loss narrative misses um, is all the things that you all are, you know, jumping right on in the chat, which is that um, very few people are motivated um, by hearing that they're learning losers. 
um, you know, hearing how far behind you are um, in the standards that we set for you, you know, some all education policymakers set, you know, not nearly as motivating as saying, what did you do that was great? What are you most proud of? Um, what are the great new capacities that you develop um, that we can build on and learn in these ways? I mean, none of that is setting aside, you know, the really important fact that if there are some, you know, core parts of mathematics that kids miss, we got to find a way um, in this uh, in this interview that we did with teachers. Um, there was one teacher who said, look, we're going to do what we do every year, which is we're going to scoop them where we need to scoop them. <laughs> we're going to keep going this year. We're going to figure out what they know and what they don't know. And every year kids come in and there's stuff that they don't understand as well as they need to to learn this year's stuff. Um, and I just love that line that she had. We're going to scoop them where we want to scoop them. Um, so, so our proposal in this report is to try to create a third kind of story, um, which is about humane reinvention which is about saying, what are we gonna take that's the best of last year and bring that forward? What did we get let go of last year that we can keep getting rid of, that we can keep letting go of? Um, in the United States, one of the things that we found um, is that when people think about, when, when young people talk to us, when teachers talk to us about reinventing schools, they weren't just talking about reinventing schools in response to a pandemic, um, but they were talking about reinventing schools in response to chronic deficiencies and chronic inequalities that we have in our systems. Um, so I wanna tell you one of my favorite stories from this research. Um, so Nima and I work together and we come up with a series of questions that we wanna ask students. Maybe I'll actually skip ahead here um, and tell you what sort of the final version of these five questions ended up being. Um, so one was, what are the aspects of remote learning that you have really appreciated the most and would like to see carried back into in-person schooling? What was really hard about remote learning that you hope you never have to manage again as a student? Um, we did this in a different order with the first group, so I'm going to do it like this. What do you feel like you missed out on or lost because of the pandemic in school this year? What are you most proud of this year? And then with NEMA students, we tried this. The question that we ended with is, after this pandemic, what do you hope adults will do to make in-person school better for next year? What do you hope they don't do to school next year? Um, so this really draws on what NEMA was talking about before of when we come to moments in which the path forward is not clear, let's talk to students and have them give us their ideas. Um, so we do this. We, we, we've done, we've asked a series of questions about like, what do you feel like you lost? What was hard? Um, and then we say, what should adults do next year? And Nima, do you remember this, that the very first, I think it was the very first student who spoke up in your class said, we should build a pool. Yeah. Um, and Nima was facilitating and I was taking notes and I was like, I just, I want to listen to you. It, well, I, my first reaction was like, what does a pool have to do with the pandemic? Like, why are we talking about a pool? Um, but then I think I was able to do what I think Nima is so great at doing, which is saying, I, let's believe that this kid was giving us his opinion um, from an honest and serious place. And what does that mean? Um, because then some of the other answers we heard, um, I don't remember, tell me if you remember others of these, Nima, but um, thinking about- People were talking about the bathrooms, they were talking about lunch, they were talking about just things about school that were a problem prior to the pandemic, right? Like, in a way, kids took it as an opportunity to talk about school in general, um, and were less worried about returning from the pandemic and more worried about school didn't work for me in all these ways before. And your, you know, your students in Boston know that kids in suburbs go to schools that have pools associated with them. Um, that what you know, your student asking for a pool was, you know, he's asking specifically for a pool, but more broadly, how do we create schools in Boston that have all the same kinds of resources as students in other places? Um, we were talking with a group of, later Nima couldn't join it. I don't think Nima, you were here for this, um, but we were talking with the uh, teachers in Milwaukee. And again, we said like, what should we do next year? And one of them said, we need to bring back driver's ed. And we're like, what does driver's ed 
have to do with a pandemic? Well, as someone pointed out in the chat, many, many students during the pandemic got jobs. At this particular school in Milwaukee, their survey suggested that 60% of high school students were wage earners in their family, like not just kids with jobs, but people who are, who are contributing to their family's budgets. Um, and the public transportation system in Milwaukee is not very good. Lots of families have at least one car. Um, and so getting more kids driver's ed would help them get to their jobs, get home in time to get their homework done and things like that. Um, so part of what we took from these answers that sort of surprised us um, the pool, the driver's ed, was when we talk about humane reinvention, we're not just talking about um, fixing things that we saw that were broken during the pandemic. We're talking about fixing inequalities and deficiencies in our schools that we see year after year after year. Um, and the young people that we talked with asked us to draw our attention to those ongoing systemic inequalities, um, not just the problems that we saw, you know, that are related to the pandemic in the last uh, 12 months. Um, you know, in a sense, there's a kind of real sort of maturity and sophistication um, that I was kind of missing behind that first answer of the pool. Um, you know, um, here are three kind of big themes that we saw in our report. Um, that a big thing students felt like they were missing um, were missed con social connections, missed connections with their teachers, but also a growing sense of autonomy. Um, kids learned wearing sweatshirts. They learned wearing sweatshirts that had hoods on them. They snacked when they want to. They went to the bathroom when they want to. They did all of the things that we don't let them do in schools, and they were still able to learn. Um, they experienced a kind of growing freedom, a growing autonomy, and an incredible responsibility for their own learning. Um, from teachers, this was actually a hard one to summarize, because when we asked teachers what it is that they wanted to do differently next year, they gave us really different kinds of answers. Some teachers said, we did way too much technology and we really got to get away from it. Some folks said, we did great things with technology this year and we want to do more of it next year. Um, some teachers said um, that they wanted to find more time for individual connections with students and families. Some teachers said that they wanted you know, to, to spend more time building community in their classroom, that community wasn't just like a mini unit that they did at the beginning of the year, but something that really needed to be threaded throughout. Um, but, you know, I mean, again, in contrast to this idea of learning loss that, you know, there's sort of one set of, uh, you know, research guided fixes to all of our problems, um, that there's actually many, many different problems that people see in different communities. Um, and then an overwhelming common theme was this idea of the pandemic as a window into long standing school uh, inequities, um, particularly inequities in ways. Um, that we treat and oftentimes over police our students. Um, one of my favorite quotations in the report is this from Nima, but, but Nima, people can read the quote on their own, but maybe you could just talk a little bit about what you see as opportunities post pandemic um, to go from these places where kids were learning at home and not so policed and how might we use those insights as we bring kids back to school this year. A question that I've been asking a lot in my school community is, why do we have the rules that we have? What is the function of a rule? Do we have the rule because it does something to support student learning? Or do we have the rule because we've all been conditioned to think that young people in our school buildings need to be controlled? And even just pushing people to think about that question has resulted in a lot of really important conversations and reflections. I've been teaching since 2003, and I really came into teaching kind of at the height of what we call like the no excuses uh, movement in the United States, which is sort of like a set of rules and expectations around school that really leave very little space for young people to be fully human. We control what kids wear in school. We control whether where they walk. We control how they sit in class. We control um, how they speak to each other. We punish them when they don't meet those expectations. And I just think that the, for young people, in some ways they had also been, become acclimated to going to school in that kind of context. And what the pandemic did is it showed both kids and teachers that a lot of those rules had nothing to do with learning. My kids were learning in their pajamas. 
They were learning from their beds. They were learning while they ate. They went to the bathroom when they needed to go to the bathroom. None of that stopped them from learning. And so as we re-enter schools, I think it's really important that we continue to interrogate what parts of school are about learning and what parts of school are about control. Mm. Um, as our colleague John Mehta said, uh, we learned that the, as kids were sitting on their beds or sitting on their couches, we learned that the depth of your seat cushion doesn't relate to the depth of your learning. Um, and I like that one. All right, we're going to do an exercise together here, um, which is another one of the of the sets of protocols that we did with groups of teachers, um, with, actually with these sort of design charrettes. One way to advance these conversations um, is to take some of the questions that we showed before, ask them of students, synthesize the answers, and share them with other people in your community. Um, a second approach is to bring different kinds of folks in a community together, some students, some teachers, some school leaders, other people, um, and think about, you know, continue to think about how do we design school this year? How do we design school next year? that builds on what we've learned in the pandemic. Um, so we're gonna do a little, ex one of these exercises that we did very productively with other people. Um, we'll, do a, we'll do a few of these things here together now. Um, one was a set of three questions that we asked uh, called Amplify Hospice Create. Um, we asked uh, these three questions, we'll do it together. The way we're gonna answer these questions um, is with a, uh, um, uh, a waterfall approach. So what I'm going to ask you to do in a minute uh, is to type your answer to the first question into the chat, but don't hit return until I say so. Um, I'll give you all two or three minutes. Um, this is your, and I'm sort of modeling this so that you can do it with your, with your colleagues, with your students, for other folks, if you um, gather people together on Zoom to do this kind of work. Um, what went really well in remote or hybrid or pandemic inflected learning last year that we can build on this year. Um, go ahead and take a minute or two um, and we'll just be uh, uh, quiet together for a minute or two and type in the chat box, but don't hit return yet. Um, what's, what's one or two things that went really well in remote and hybrid learning last year that we can build on this year? And I'll give everybody sort of one more minute to think about their answer to that and then ask you to share. That's all right, Julia. It's good. It's good to get going. Okay, go ahead and hit enter. Um, let's share what some of these things are. Um, so you see the sort of new ideas come out in kind of a in kind of a waterfall fashion. Um, I'll highlight one of the first ones that came in. Um, Lorraine said, "Giving kids breaks between lessons that didn't involve them racing off to another classroom." Um, we heard breaks from dozens of kids and teachers who reported back to us. Um, and I got really interested in this. And so I started asking people online, what kind of breaks that were new did you give your students last year? And I'll tell you, we heard every possible answer. There were schools that made lunch longer. There are schools that made research recess longer. There are schools that made passing time longer. There are schools that switched to a block schedule and put breaks in class. Um, there are schools that went back in person that had walk around outside and mask breaks. Um, just about every kind of break you can imagine was reinvented in schools over the past year. Um, and a lot of people talked about how oftentimes our school days feel like it's just one thing after another, after another, after another. If you were to design the best possible learning environment, would you design one that had no time for reflection? We know that reflection is central to sort of synthesizing learning, to regaining the kind of balance and composure that difficult learning activities take. Um, what is it that we can learn about all the breaks that all the schools took last year um, that might help us uh, do a better job uh, in future years? Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I was just trying to scroll. Um, Nima, were there any of these other answers that you saw that really caught your eye? Um, I think a lot of people talking about students having more voice and choice, having more autonomy, having more opportunities for reflection, um, really needing to adapt quickly, like everyone's sort of ability to adapt and change was a, a huge thing that people learned how to do quickly. Lots of positive stuff here. 
yeah, my good colleague Susan Buckley talks about these sort of interesting findings that we we also found when we interviewed 60 teachers. Um, there were some students uh, who have different disabilities and learning differences that had a really tough time this past year. And there were some students who really benefited. Um, students who are overstimulated by having lots of kids in a class, um, students who have social anxieties and things like that. Um, a lot of folks, um, you know, a lot of those kinds of students really benefited from having sort of quieter places to learn and are now thinking about like, okay, when we go back into schools, how can we make physical spaces in our schools that give students who need that sort of quieter space um, a place to go and a place to connect? Um, yeah, um, let's do a second one of these questions, which is um, again, a sort of waterfall question um, of what should we hospice? Um, what is it, um, and hospice for people who don't know, um, is this idea that when people are passing away, you create a sort of special space for them to, to pass away. So some, we've also referred to this, I don't know if you all are familiar with the, with the Japanese organizing uh, professional Marie Kondo. Um, who, uh, who goes across the United States into Americans' homes because Americans own way too much stuff. Um, and she helps them sort of throw away and say goodbye to the stuff they don't need anymore. Um, what, you know, innovation can't just be additive. We can't make schools better um, by simply doing more and more different kinds of things. What can we let go of? Um, what is it that we don't want to return back um, when we come back uh, to school this year? Thanks, Megan, for posting the Marie Kondo, your curriculum link. Um, but let's do one more waterfall question. What are some things that over the past 18 months, your school or school system has been able to let go of that we, that we can hope doesn't come back? Um, take another minute to think about this, and in, and, and in one minute, I'll invite you to share your answers. Good. All right. If you've got something in there that you can share, go ahead and uh, type it in the box and uh, we can sort of scroll through and, and uh, see what's in there. Um, six, eight class period days. Um, uh, curriculum rigidity, too much content, um, spending too much time. Um, giving folks more more flexibility to learn from home, um, you know, a bunch of people finding that they actually kind of like some of the things that they uh, some of the online learning experiences. Maybe not to be all the time. Um, Sam Hop talks about uh, uh, start times that are incredibly early um, and uh, um, you know not uh, um, not aligned with what we know, you know, particularly about adolescent biology. Um, what, are, what are some others that I... Um, sure. The breadth versus depth approach that sort of drives curriculum in a lot of cases. Some of the people want to get rid of that. Um, Maha mentioned hard deadlines. That was something that we heard over and over again. Um, actually, we heard it a bunch from students talking to their teachers too. Um, students saying, man, I really appreciate the flexibility that teachers showed this year, that helped me. Um, that helped me learn. And I hope that they'll keep up uh, some of that grace and flexibility uh, when we come back uh, in the following year. Um, so one of the things that we did with, uh, um, as a way to sort of summarize some of these things is that we would, you know, as you, as you assemble these lists of what people want to amplify and what people want to hospice, you'll find that they sort of organize themselves into themes. Um, actually, some of the things that you all are talking about here um, connect to a few of the themes that we highlighted in the report. Um, people want to, you know, in the, in the theme of trust and relationship, um, what are things that we did really well last year? We added home visits, we added advisories, um, we had virtual parent teacher meetings. Um, what are the things that we want to get away from? It's rushing through content and feeling these transactional relationships, the notion that we need face-to-face -face connection for all meetings. And then you start thinking about with, with what you're going to amplify and what you're going to hospice, like what do you need to create? Um, what would it be that you could pull together um, and invent to have some of these themes come to be the case? 
Um, what are some schedule things that work really well that we want to amplify? What are some schedule things that are not working well that we want to hospice? What kinds of things do we need to create to make those kinds of possible? And there's maybe, you know, a table full of kind of 10 kinds of lines like this. Of course, the answers that we share from lots of different people in lots of different schools are probably not nearly as important as the answers that you all would come up with with your communities in your schools. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, one um, protocol that we, you know, I, if there are two things that we share in the report, it's a series of findings. It's a series of things that we discovered by talking to lots of people. Um, but the people we talk to are not exactly your people. Um, they're not exactly your folks in your context. And, and probably as important it is to hear what, what lots of folks in lots of different places are thinking about these themes, um, what we really want to try to empower you to do is take some of the tools that we use to spark these conversations um, and to have them in your own local contexts. Um, so one of those... Uh, um, uh, tools was Amplify Hospice Create. Um, we showed you this second set of questions uh, that we think you'll find useful, which was uh, you can find at uh, bit.ly slash imagining September. Um, this was probably our favorite tool because our um, uh, very great colleague and artist, uh, um, uh, Haley, put together some really beautiful slides for us of asking these five questions that I showed you before. Um, what are the aspects of remote learning that you've appreciated the most? What was really hard about remote learning? Um, what do you hope adults do differently next year? What do you feel like you missed out or lost on? Um, and then what are you most proud of? So a third protocol that we used and that we shared in the report is um, we had the sense that not everyone coming back to schools saw the challenges of reopening, um, redeveloping schools this year um, in the same kind of way. Um, so, um, but I'm gonna go back to those. So what we did um, is that we had uh, four different questions that we asked people. We happen to use Google Jamboard for answering these, but you could imagine using other kinds of technology tools. Um, and we basically replaced the word stakeholder with each of these groups. What are the problems that students are hoping that we solve this year? What are the problems that teachers are hoping that we solve this year? What are the problems that families are hoping that we solve this year? And what are the problems that admins are hoping that we solve this year? Um, Nima, you participated in um, at least one of these activities. Uh, do you remember some of the themes that came up uh, in your group as you were, um, or in your design charrette as you were talking about some of these differences? I think so. I mean, I think I remember that, you know, a lot of the differences were related to people's really specific locations that for teachers, um, the level of sort of conflicting messaging around both like really like the strong emphasis on building anti-racist classrooms and schools, and then the broader context of, um, of a society that uh, continues to have very racist structures. It was like a real tension and challenge that teachers are trying to figure out in their return to school but also that there were young people in our conversation who were really focused on like, how are we going to make school feel like a place that we want to be um, and that we feel excited to be. And then that was a big challenge that a lot, a lot of young people were articulating. Um, Maserat, oh, uh, somebody, somebody got the link to work. Thank you, Stephanie. That's, that's why we're a community here. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think it was doing this exercise, one of the things that people value is that they realize even though students and teachers and families and admins are to some extent all working together, they all are facing kind of different challenges and different dilemmas. Um, students overwhelmingly, um, like their core concern is that they miss their friends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as Nima came, uh, some of the first things Nima was sharing was that like, I, I mean, I think this very, like kids are excited to come back to school. They're also trying to figure out how to be together with one another again. Um, how do you be together with masks on? Um, how do you be together with the different rules that schools have into, you know, implemented and so forth around you know, public health, but also just different kinds of changes? Um, if we can't address, if schools can't address some of the core concerns they have 
um, about how they're going to feel connected and socialize with other folks, it's going to be awfully hard for them to make progress on their learning. Um, one of the things I think it was Derek brought up before is just like the really hard feelings that teachers are feeling right now. Um, like lots of, you know, almost everyone in the pandemic had a really hard and painful year. Um, and it's tough to go back to a job. It's rewarding and wonderful, but tough to go back to a job um, where you're then taking on, taking care of lots of other people. Um, it's also hard to, um, to feel like, you know, um, that the work that you do can be taken for granted. Um, but, um, I think there's also ways that teachers have looked at this year and said, oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we did better that we ought to figure out how we bring in. Um, I think families in many ways um, found some new ways to be connected with schools last year that they were really excited about. Um, you know, I mean, one of the core concerns that we heard from families is just getting kids back into schools so that adults can go to work um, and lead the lives that they were experiencing uh, before the pandemic. But a lot of questions is like, oh, I felt really connected with my kids and my teachers this year. How am I gonna keep up those connections? Um, one of the differences that we saw when we looked at the kinds of posts that admins put up um, is just so many of them were questions. How do I help teachers bridge from survival mode to thriving? Um, how do we change our agreements about time given what we've learned next year? Um, how do we capitalize on the good learning that teachers have done? How do I spend the new stimulus funds that are coming in the United States? Um, you know, doing an exercise like this doesn't solve all these problems, but it gets the problems on the table and it helps people see how folks from different perspectives see challenges differently. You know, one of the main things probably if you're an admin um, is recognizing that even though you have this big pile of post-it notes of challenges, um, that probably some of the first things to think about are the challenges that your students and teachers are experiencing. Um, what do they need to feel successful and to be connected? Um, uh, a final activity that we did um, that we describe in the report um, is to ask people to think about what might be some good metaphors for what we, what we want schools to look like this year and in the year to come. Um, much of what we have to do to prepare for school this year uh, feels like it sort of fits on checklists. Um, have you put all of your stuff on your learning management system site? Do we have enough masks? Did you, um, have, has everyone agreed um, to the testing protocol? Uh, have you done this piece and that piece and the third piece and the fourth piece? And I don't want to minimize all those things because they're all important. But ultimately, what we want to do is think about if we were in a school that felt like it was a really powerful, healthy place for healing to happen and for learning to reemerge this year in powerful ways, what might that look like? Um, to help us sort of step away from the checklist kind of day-to-day -day minutia of schools, um, we ask people to think about metaphors, metaphors that could be sort of tent pole ideas that could organize a school's response. Um, and people came up with some really interesting metaphors. Um, one, you know, some of the folks said uh, going back to school felt like a family reunion, um, a place where family members get together at a long time after a long time to reconnect with each other, to celebrate growth, um, to remember old memories, to pick old fights. Um, uh, another uh, uh, a group of folks um, uh, thought about like, um, sort of religious institutions and the learning that happens in religious institutions. You know, what is it like where, you know, where do people feel like their learning is really whole, um, that they're treated as a whole person? Um, and part of what we then do to sort of break down these narratives is we say, well, all right, um, in the United States, it's not appropriate to turn schools into churches or temples or mosques, but what happens at churches or temples or mosques that we could learn from about building communities? Well, people eat together at the end of a religious ceremony. What it would look like to find some places to go outside and to eat together at the end of the day. Um, one of the things that people do is they create art 
um, for no other reason than the enjoyment of creating the art um, when choirs sing or when whole congregations sing? Um, what would it look like to try to do um, works of collective art that would help us uh, reflect on our experiences and connect with one another? Um, Nima, what, what were the metaphors that struck you as you participated in, in these activities? I think actually both of those were in the charrette that I was in. Um, I'm trying to, I don't remember any of the other ones, but those two are definitely there in the, in the one that I was in. Um, you know, other people thought about, uh, um, you know, schools as sort of journeys or schools as transportation stations. Um, how do we have people come to our school, feel like they're getting ready and then go out and go forward on, um, on interesting missions, on interesting journeys, on interesting ideas. Um, again, the, the point of the metaphors is not to um, say, okay, now we're gonna turn our school exactly into a family reunion, but to think about what are the kinds of cognate experiences that we feel like would be rich um, and be meaningful for young people, for adults, would help us feel reconnected. Um, we need, I think part of emerges from the idea is, you know, the kinds of things that we usually do in schools are not exactly right to get us started this year. The world is different because of the past two years and our institutions need to adapt um, to do that. I mean, I think that connects Nima to the theme that you've been writing about and talking about, um, about schools um, and their emphasis of sort of getting back to normal as you've been writing and, and talking to people. Um, what do you think are some of the key themes of what schools need to be thinking about doing differently from their usual patterns this year? I think this has been really hard uh, because I think everyone's inclination has been to sort of return to what school looked like pre-pandemic. But I really feel like if we were doing this right, we would slow things way down and we'd really ask the question is, what would it mean if schools were spaces of healing? Like, what would we be doing if the goal was to have all young people feel like they were whole before we jumped into the work of learning? Um, because overwhelmingly what I feel like I both heard from kids before they came back to school and I'm seeing from kids now that we're in school is that kids are carrying a lot of hurt with them and it's manifesting in lots of different ways. Um, it's not easy for young people to be back in person. There's a lot of challenges of relearning each other, relearning yourself, um, relearning what it means to be a student in school, losing autonomy. There's a lot to mourn and grieve uh, in terms of what's happened to people over the last 18 months. And so I feel like the question that I would love for us to be asking is like, how might we think about schools as sites of healing um, as a priority and as the predecessor to being sites of learning? So you're teaching ethnic studies this year, you know, concretely in your classroom, what are some of the things that you're doing to try to you know, integrate those themes into your day to day? I mean, everything, right? Like I'm, I'm really lucky. I am teaching a subject this year that doesn't have an assessment at the end of it. It doesn't have a long list of standards that I have to make my way through. So I really can make my class be about healing. And so, you know, we started the year um, with an art project where we talked about the fact that schools don't necessarily feel like safe places right now. And the world doesn't necessarily feel safe right now. There are two pandemics that we're battling, COVID and a pandemic of racial injustice. And so we talked about shields um, and what a shield functions for and how uh, like the idea that shields create safety. And then young people got the chance to build their own shields where they painted um, on cardboard pizza rounds, but they painted shields with images and words that evoke safety and comfort for them. And then my job after I get off this webinar is to hang them up around the room so that like when kids come into this space, their shield is up. And if they're having a hard time in my space, there are things that evoke home and safety and comfort for them, right? That was like the first three days. Then today we did an activity that was around mapping the terrain of your life, where we reflected it on like our highs and lows over the course of our lives, in terms of our relationships, in terms of events that we've experienced, in terms of groups we've been a part of, um, really trying to keep centering young people's identities to give them space to talk and think about their lives pre-pandemic and during the pandemic, um, to give them time to share with each other and connect with each other about 
both the sort of joys that they've experienced and the trauma that they've experienced during this time, I really feel like my job is to continue to think about ways that we are centering identity and centering lived experience and valuing what, what young people are bringing in as opposed to in the learning loss paradigm where we wouldn't care at all what kids were bringing in with them and we're just gonna message to them that they are not enough. My job is to be like, you're everything. Like you're already enough. And my job is just to sort of nurture what's already in you. Yeah, really, as a couple folks pointed out, kind of really powerful. Um, but also things that are not necessarily disconnected from academic content areas. I mean, if part of what you're building there is an ethnic studies curriculum, you know, the immigrant experience is a huge part of understanding ethnic studies and part of the immigration experience um, is coming to a new and unfamiliar place um, and figuring out what are going to be the shields that protect you during this place. I mean, I, I imagine that the kind of work that you're doing um, in these first few weeks about identity, about safety can be woven into to the academic content of what you're doing later on. Um, yeah, and I think that's an important point, Justin, is I think sometimes people think it's an either or proposition, that it's like you're either doing socio-emotional work or you're doing content. I don't think it has to be that divided. I think there are ways to do both at the same time. I think there are ways to center young people's identities and hold content and be working on content um, simultaneously. But I do feel like sometimes we're pushed into these corners of like, you're either doing one or the other. And I would really encourage people to resist that and to think about the ways you can hold them simultaneously. Yeah, you know, I mean, I teach it at MIT, which is full of weird, weird kids, um, wonderful, weird kids. And uh, I'm always struck as, you know, as we've navigated various kinds of traumas over the last 10 years that, um, that the, there's certain kinds of academic content learning that they just find like really satisfying and sort of comforting to be part of. Um, you know, for, and I, and I think that can, that can be true for a lot of kids, you know, that, uh, um, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be young kids coming back to schools in ALA classes that are just like super excited to be reading novels again, um, not just alone, but with other people. Um, and so figuring out that combination of how are we, you know, making more time and more space for helping young people feel whole? How are we finding the parts of school that they were sort of most excited about before and giving them space and time for that? Be like, oh, you're going to get back to some of these things that we really liked about um, being together. Uh, but I think there are, there, there are, you know, um, I don't know, teachers are always trying to find ways uh, to pluck two berries off the bush with one hand. Um, and I think this is another place to, to try to be creative uh, about that. Um, so anyway, um, it's been really wonderful getting a chance to spend about an hour with you uh, sharing these ideas. Um, the report is called uh, Healing Community and Humane Reinvention, How Students and Teachers Want to Reinvent Schools uh, Post-COVID. Um, you can find it at tsl.mit.edu slash COVID-19. Um, there's uh, a whole bunch of other folk. Um, I, I had posted earlier in the conversation some uh, links of some great things that Nima has shared recently, but if you just, uh, um, a useful thing to do every uh, couple of weeks is to do a Google search for Nima Avashia um, and news and uh, see what new kinds of writing and new kinds of things uh, she's been up to. Um, only trouble will come if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> only, only trouble uh, will come with you of that. Um, we have one more report that's gonna be out um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. My colleague, Chris Buttimer is here. Um, and uh, we have uh, an interview with uh, about 60 teachers that we've done um, where, you know, if the theme of this report is really like how much we need to be listening to students, um, there's a lot that uh, school leaders should have been doing this past year to listen to teachers, to listen to the folks who are sort of closest for these challenges um, and uh, what we could learn from them for doing better in the future. Um, Nima, any final uh, words of wisdom to folks as they're, uh, as they're heading out for the rest of the school year? I just uh, I really encourage you to get as proximate as you can to the people who are directly experiencing this and then to amplify what they're telling you. So if you work with young people, listening to them and then sharing what they're saying with your colleagues 
and your supervisors, if you work with educators doing the same, it just feels like right now the decisions are being made by people who are very, very far away um, from the lived reality that we're all in. And so the more you can do to be a bridge, I think the better off we'll be. Yeah, and hopefully the tools that are in this report are concrete ways you can talk with students, you can talk together with teachers. And as Nima said, like, you know, not all of us have power, like probably nobody here was a national minister of education, maybe nobody was a superintendent, but all of us have the capacity to talk to young people about their experiences, to talk to teachers working about their experiences and share what we're learning. Um, and the more we do that, the more we'll have systems that are really designed to respond to the needs of those folks. Um, well, Nima Avashia, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much uh, around the world who were able to spend some time with us today. Um, and I hope you have uh, a, a wonderful afternoon uh, or evening or morning. And I hope these tools are, are useful for you in the work that you're doing in the future. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.